Alrighty, who's ready to learn? <sighs> Crickets. Check this out. I got a class with me today. It's too hard for a penguin. Arr. All right, so I got I got a I got observers, so I gotta make sure I'm, I have my a game. So your first test is going to be on information up to page fourteen in your supplemental materials. So everything uh, before uh, the detailed ankle joint. So we're going to get into the ankle joint in more detail. We're going to talk illusions. We're going to talk about uh, bony articulations. We're going to really get in there uh, and develop those concepts. So now I'm just introducing you to the concepts of uh, not just joints, but the different types of joints. And uh, we're going to go into more details about those classifications. We call them classifications. So let's remember, a classification of a joint, there's several sub-classifications. So... Um, so that's what we're going to get into today is the subclassifications of the slightly movables and the uh, significant movable joints, okay? There's really no subclassifications of synarthrodial joints. <clears throat> the ones that are fused, you, you don't, <laughs> there, there's no subclassifications of not moving. You know, it, you're, you're fused, you don't move. It's kind of hard to, to, uh, to get, it, it's kind of easy to be absolute when there's no movement because of fusion. And so I mentioned where these synarthrodial joints are found. You have the pelvis, where you have the ilium right here, your ischium back here, and your pubis, and they fuse inside the acetabulum, the socket, right? So that's where the fusion takes place. And again, why aren't you born with fusion there? Because you need to allow... Um, you need to be patient. You need to grow that socket out and then eventually when those bones have their final resting place in terms of size and girth and depthness, then they can uh, fuse up and allow a, a, a solid rigid link there, okay? Uh, again, the sutures in the skull, example of uh, synarthrotic fused uh, joints. Now, you have other places that fuse, like your growth plates fuse, but that's within a bone. That's that's within the bone itself. These are fusions inter in between bones, like interstate fusions. Okay, so this bone fuses with that bone. So that is different than the growth plate fusions, but it's a similar concept. It's kind of similar. All right. So synarthrodial joints. Then we have. Uh, from last class, the amphiarthrodial joints, the slightly movable joints, the little bit of give. And I told you why sometimes we have to have a little bit of give. Building skyscrapers have a little bit of give. Trees have a little bit of give. Flowers have a little bit of give. Technically, trained boxers, when they get hit and it looks bad, it's not as bad because professional boxers are trained to go with the punch so it looks like it's bad but if you go with it and you give with it you can dissipate that force over a greater period of time and distance and it, it's not as impactful okay so places that we have a little bit of give they subclassify it because of what's responsible for the little bit of give so different places in the body, you can have two bones that have a little bit of give, a little bit of motion because of cartilaginous, cartilage articulation between those two bones, okay? A little bit of give because of cartilage. Think of it like this. If I had um, a uh, water balloon in between my hands and I had a little bit of give between this bone and that bone, my left hand and my right hand, it's because of that water balloon that I kind of have a little bit of give. And that's what happens with your the anterior articulations of your vertebral discs, okay? These, these cartilaginous discs are, are really kind of like water balloons, but instead of water it's more like a uh, toothpaste. It's viscosity of like thick toothpaste. Any two vertebra, so my left hand and my right hand, doesn't allow significant motion. You know, you're not going to do 
that that would be a bad day. You're going to have a little bit of give, right? So any two vertebra is not significant. <clears throat> it's more movement than nothing, but it's less movement <laughs> than a lot, okay? So what do you get when something's in the middle? It's not hot. It's colder than hot, but it's hotter than cold. You get warm. You get something in the middle. That's a little bit of both. Warm is a little bit of both, if you think about it. So that's what amphiarthrotic joints are. They're more movable than the synarthrotic, but they're less movable than the diarthrotic. You know, your elbows and your knees and your hips. So we have to have a different classification for them. Slightly movable because of cartilaginous inter, um, intermediaries, because of cartilage in the middle between the bones, is called synchondrotic. It's a subclassification. So any two vertebra have slightly movable, the bodies of these vertebra are slightly movable because of synchondrotic articulation. Subclassification, synchondrotic, because of cartilage, chondrotic cartilage. Another place where you have slight movable uh, mo mo mobility, I almost said movability, but that would have been the delcom in me coming out. Slight mobility is right here in between your pubis. You don't have a lot, but you got a little bit of play between your right and left hemipelvis. It's your right and left pelvis. Now, we don't want to have too much motion. We don't open up like an oyster shell. We don't do this, but there is a little bit rotation kind of in that frontal plane. And that's because our legs go up a lot. And if you didn't give that pelvis a little bit of motion, we, we eventually have stress fractures in here anyway. And so we give a little bit of play because of cartilage. Another area where we have a little bit of play because of, uh, of well, no, I did the cartilage ones, cartilage, cartilage. Now we'll get into the subclassification of amphiarthrotic, a little bit of play because of ligaments. Now, this is where, instead of a buffer, so you think, again, like the cartilage stuff is kind of like a water balloon buffer in between the bones. This is where there's a little bit of play, but it literally is bone articulating with bone. Now, of course, there's fluid in there and, uh, and, and you know, the hyaline cartilage and, 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 and the, the, uh, the, the fluid-filled sacs that, that try to minimize friction, all right? I'm, I'm not saying there's not – I'm not saying it's literally bone on bone, but you don't have a cartilaginous water balloon in between. For these, a lot of the cartilaginous slightly movable is one end, and then on the other end, we have slightly movable because of the ligaments, because of traditional articulating surfaces. So let's look at these vertebra in more detail. In the front, you got fluid-filled sacs, and that's a, for that because there's a lot of uh, compression forces that those those uh, those the bodies of these vertebra are 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 um, loading against, right, or holding up. So it makes sense that having these water balloons in there kind of helps them do that job of, of, of weight bearing, right? But in the back, we connect not just in the front, but we connect in the back. And so all of these different vertebra connect to each other posteriorly because of traditional bone articulate with bone and you have ligaments and you have uh, fluid. Uh, so, so they're slightly movable back here in between the facets. We call them facet joints. But all of these are slightly movable. And it makes sense. You don't want them to move too much. And not only are you trying to maintain integrity of the spine, but the way they articulate creates natural tunnels for your arteries and your veins and your nerves to run through. We have to have a lot of law and order in there to make sure that things don't get snapped off, pinched off, okay? So we give a little bit, but we don't give too much. So articulations that give a little bit because of ligamentous, traditional bone, articulate with bone through ligamentous attachment is called syndesmotic. And again, this is a subclassification of amphiarthrotic joints. Syndesmotic. Now, what we, what we won't do, I'm going to get to this when we get to diarthritic joints. 
we can't look at the whole spine like one big slinky and say syndesmotic. We have to look at any two bones and say any two articulations of bones doesn't have significant motion. Just like any one day of throwing pocket change in the bucket isn't significant savings, but the sum total of them is a different story. So I'm going to get to the sum total of the little bits and how that gives us significant motion. But I want to clarify that when I talk about these in terms of uh, amphiarthrotic joints, synchondrotic and syndesmotic, we're only looking at any two and how they move about each other. Okay. We also can look at syndesmotic from my example of uh, the pubis. So the pubis was synchondrotic cartilage, but in the back where the left and right pelvis articulate with the sacrum, we have a sacroiliac joint. And that is traditional bone articulating with bone, right? Because of ligamentous issues. Now, if if you allow a little bit of motion in the front, because this is what we call a rigid link, it's a solid structure. If you allow a little bit of rotation in the front, there's got to be a little bit of play in the back. That's physics. If you rotate the front, the back of my hand has to go back. So if this side of my palm goes forward, the back side of my finger has got to go back. So we have to have something in place to allow a little bit of motion back here because we allow a little bit of motion up here. Okay. So that is an example of a syndesmotic joint because of ligaments. Other examples of syndesmotic joints are uh, uh, your metacarpals. In between your metacarpals, there's a little bit of play, nothing significant like your fingers, but you have more laxity here. Why? Because when you contour around things, you wanna be able to wrap your hand around things you're gripping and holding. And so having a little bit of play in between uh, your metacarpals help you to do that. And again, that's ligamentous, uh, syn syndesmotic, okay? Now let's get into the main dish, the diarthritic joints, the big hosses. We're gonna have subclassifications of diarthritic joints and then we're gonna have subclassifications of subclassification diarthritic joints. Uh, I don't wanna say it like that, but there's a lot of different diarthritic joints because we have a lot of things that create significant motion, okay? We are going to rank these based on movement capabilities. And this is where we start tying things together from some of our original lectures. What is, how does one joint have more or less the same movement capabilities? What is the uh, scale of movement capabilities? How do we measure movement capabilities? Planes and axes, okay? So when we have significant motion that occurs in one plane of that joint's motion, that joint's motion, about one axis about that joint's motion, that is what we call a uniaxial joint. An example of a uniaxial joint is the elbow. The elbow is like the hinge of a door, except Instead of the door being like this traditionally, when we're in anatomical position, a door does like this. So think of it as uh, in some of those movies where they have, uh, when, th when the, the tornado is coming and everybody goes into the cellar and they have the door that lifts up like that and everybody runs inside, right? It's kind of the same plane of motion. So again, why does perspective matter? Because I can flex my elbow in all three global planes but I only move it in one of my elbows local planes, okay? So it's uniaxial relative, it's uniaxial locally referenced to the elbow, not from the world, okay? Now, I'm gonna get into these in a little bit, but I wanted to explain how these diarthritic joints get subclassified. So we're gonna have a uniaxial classification, and there's going to be some different types in there based on uh, whether it's in the transverse or other. I'll get to that a little bit. 
we have some biaxials, and then we're going to have some triaxials. And there ain't no more axial than that. Uni, bi, tri. And then we have kind of this uh, apple, banana, strawberry sledgehammer. We have something that's kind of like, well, technically it's significant, but it's the sum total of a bunch of little bits. Technically, it's significant motion, but it's the sum total of a bunch of amphiarthritic little bits. Technically, I have $300 saved up in my change bucket, but it's the sum total of a bunch of little bits. Okay, So I'm going to start there. The first classification, sorry, subclassification of diarthrodial joints is called orthrodial. Very clever and creative Arthrodial joints, these are what we consider gliding joints or summation of a bunch of little bits. So remember, when we were looking at amphiarthrotic, slightly movable, insignificant motion, still more than none, we only looked at two pieces. When we look at the whole thing, all of the little bits... We're looking at them as a team. The sum total of all those little bits create significant motion. The sum total of all the little bits in my neck creates significant motion. The sum total of all the little bits in my trunk creates significant motion. Now, all of that motion does not occur about one axis. Think about it. My elbow, I can point to a bilateral axis and have all of my motion occur about that fixed point. But here, if I'm flexing and extending my trunk in the sagittal plane, there's significant motion. And it's occurring in a sagittal plane. But I have an insignificant amount happening here, an insignificant amount happening here, 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 here. There's several little insignificant bilateral axes. So that's why in your book, it's considered non-axial. Not that there's not rotation, not that there's not an axis that these little insignificance occur about. It's because there's not one fixed point, like in traditional joints, there's not a fixed point that all of the rotation occurs about. So that could be very tricky unless you understand it. So if you didn't get it, hit me up. I'll be happy to try a different way to explain it. Arthrodial glidings can have an average axis, a sum total, and that sum total can occur in a plane. You know, in other words, what I mean by that is sum total sagittal, 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 sagittal. Well, that's sagittal plane gliding. But there's not one true fixed point. We can have an average point, but there's not one true fixed point, okay? So that's the tough one. Let's get the tough one out the way. Gliding joints. We're going to see gliding joints in the lower foot. These torso bones are going to glide and help us to invert and evert our foot. Gliding summation of little bits. Okay. All right. Let's get to the uniaxial joints. I'm not going to hold you responsible for the Latin terms. I'm going to hold you responsible for the layman's terms. So... Um, we call these ginglimus joints in Latin, but uh, in layman's terms, we just call them hinges, uniaxial hinges. So you think about a door like that door, and it has one axis, and it has one plane of motion. So if someone said, Dr. Campbell, what type of joint is the door? What classification? I'd say it is a uniaxial hinge, well, what classification? It'd be a diarthritic joint, and then the subclassification would be a uniaxial hinge joint. That's all it does. And again, that dimension of rotation is relative to the door. That door doesn't care if I change my view to see it sagittal. 
or if I change my view to see it transverse. It doesn't matter. The door's like, I, I, I'm a door. I do door things. I do this and this. It doesn't matter how you see me. I move in one plane, in one of my, one of my planes about one of my axes. So it's uniaxial hinge. For our bodies, we have uniaxial hinges. Our true ankle joint, when I, when I lecture detailed about the ankle, I'll explain to you why this articulation is different than what's underneath it, the gliding bones of the torso joints. So the true ankle joint, um, what you may have heard is high ankle. There's nothing high about it. That is an ankle. It's an articulation of the talus, the tibia, and the fibula right in there. All of the inversion and eversion stuff happens underneath, okay? So the ankle joint is a hinge joint. The elbow joint is a hinge joint. This is a different joint. I'm going to get to that shortly. Most of your fingers joints are hinge joints. Your interphalangeals, they'll call it. Your proximal interphalangeals is like a door. Your distal interphalangeals is like a door. Your knuckles are a little different. Your knuckles can move in two dimensions. They can do, but they can also do, mine makes that sound. Uh, so, so, so the knuckles can do something different than the digits. I can't make my digit go, okay? So it's a different kind of joint because of the way the bones are articulated, the way they come together, and the way they are allowed to move, okay? So hinge joints. Another uniaxial joint we have is what we call a, a trochoid joint, or in layman's terms, a pivot joint. Pivot joints are also uniaxial, but unlike doors and elbows that have some general motion to them, if you remember from one of our first lectures, where general motion is a combination of rotation and translation. When I move that door, yeah, there's rotation occurring, but there's also some translation. The center of mass of that door is literally being moved from one end to the other end. A revolving door, you think about a revolving door, more like a merry-go-round, the center of mass of that, all the parts doesn't move. But a traditional door, you're moving the door. You're literally moving the mass. Get out the way, door. A pivot joint is a uniaxial joint that is specialized in pure rotation. Atlas axis in our cervical vertebra, which gives us a majority of our transverse plane rotation. The other vertebra help a lot too but you have that specialized rotational atlas axis there to give you more than what you would have had without it so that you could literally look from one shoulder all the way to the other shoulder. That's a pivot joint. Our radial ulna joint is a pivot joint. The way the radius rotates about the ulna like a clock, that's a pivot joint, okay? Uniaxial, more pure rotation, all right? Now we get to the biaxial joints, and there's two kinds of oids. We have the, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about a bilaxial joint. What does that mean? That means a joint can move about two axes, so it can rotate in two planes of motion about two fixed points, about two axes. If a hinge joint is uniaxial, meaning it can rotate in one plane. How many different motions are we going to have to account for? Well, Interstate 10 travels in one straight line plane, and we can travel two different ways on that road. One road, two directions of motion. One rotational road, two directions of spin. Clockwise, counterclockwise, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Okay? So uniaxial joints, we're going to need to account for two types of rotations. Biaxial joints, we're going to have to account for four directions of motion, four types of rotation. So let me give you an example of a biaxial joint. The wrist is an example of a biaxial joint. 
and we call this an ellipsoid joint, okay? An ellipsoid joint. And one of the reasons we call it an ellipsoid joint is because you can create an ellipse with a combination of motions. This actually is a good segue into, we don't have a joint motion called circumduction. Circumduction is a, uh, is a, is a, a movement strategy. No different than uh, shooting a shot or, uh, or, 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 or shoveling. Or, or it's, a, it's a movement pattern that you do, not a specific joint motion. In other words, when I make this ellipsoid motion with my wrist, it's a combination of flexion extension with radial and ulnar deviation. In other words, as I go forward, I go to the side. And as I go back, I go to the other side. And as I go forward, it's basically taking an Etch-a-Sketch and by moving the left knob with the right knob, I can make circles, but there is no circle knob, okay? So the wrist is an ellipsoid joint. It can move about its bilateral axis, into fetal, out of fetal, sagittal plane, into fetal, out of fetal. Follow the fingers, finger flexion, wrist flexion. Wrist flexion gets you into fetal, wrist extension gets you out of fetal, okay? But it can also move about the AP axis, it could go frontal plane. And I'm going to get to this when we get into more detailed wrist lectures. So you don't have to know all these variables. All you got to know is into fetal, out of fetal. But we're going to get into deviating towards the ulna, ulna deviation, deviating towards the radius, radio deviation. Well, Dr. Campbell, how do you know? I can change it all. Well, the pinky is always going to be ulna side and the thumb is always going to be radio side. So I'm going to teach you how to not get tricked on that. But the point is our wrist is special because it can do multiple things. Biaxial, AP, bilateral, wrist joint. Another biaxial joint are the knuckles. These are called condyloid joints. And one of the reasons it has a different subclassification name is because the knuckles aren't as cemented like the wrist is. The wrist doesn't twist. The wrist is cemented in here. Now you may say, well, what's that twist? Well, that's radial ulna joint. That's, that's your radius rotating about your ulna. Look, look at my forearm shirt moving. If, if this spin happened at the wrist, you wouldn't see this clothing move, okay? The reason you see the clothing move is because that motion is happening here. If you stabilized your arm and tried to twist your wrist, it's not going anywhere. So in other words, the structure of the wrist prevents it from moving in the transverse plane. Our knuckles aren't like that. Our knuckles can actually, you could kind of have some slight movement of your knuckles in the transverse plane. It's a little bit, but it's enough to kind of call it something different than the ellipsoid joints, okay? So we have condyloids, which doesn't hurt me. I mean, your knuckles are kind of like condyles. Well, you have a lot of condyles in the body, but when you, when you make a fist, you could really see those condyles, right? So condyloid joints. Sagittal plane, flexion extension, about a bilateral axis. Frontal plane, right, about the AP axis, okay? Then we're going to get into the triaxials, uh, the ball and the sockets. So we have uh, shoulders and we have hips. Now, for clarification, the shoulder and the hip joint are the same class of joint, just like the ankle, I'm sorry, let me give you a, a better one, just like the elbow and the interphalangeals are the same class of joint, uniaxial hinges. They are different joints. <laughs> one is called the elbow and the other is called the proximal distal, whatever, first, second, third, fourth. You first, you only have a, 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 an IP joint. That's in, interphalangeal, not imperial palace for the people on the Gulf Coast of uh, Mississippi. So shoulder, hip, both ball and sockets, obviously shoulder is a different joint than the hip, but not in classification, just in name. Uh, just like my brother Jason, we are the same species of animal. We're homo sapiens, but he is a different animal than I. His name is Jason. My name is Brian. Okay. So some people will try to argue that the shoulder isn't a ball and socket because the socket isn't as uh, um, deep as the acetabulum for the hip. And my response to that is, 
You know, does a sh does, my mom's very short. Does she not count as a human because she's short? Of course not. There's a socket there. It may not be as big and deep as the hip, but it's a socket. A golf tee has a socket, right? A golf tee has a socket. Now, you don't want a big, deep socket to put the ball. You're not going to hit it out the, 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 the tee, but it's there enough to keep the ball, to, to keep the ball on the tee. And so we're going to get into that when we get into more detailed shoulder lecture. But that there is a socket there just because it's not as big and deep. It doesn't make it less of a socket. OK. The last one I want to talk about is the thumb um, uh, specifically. So this would be what we call a saddle joint. And it is the articulation between the base of the first metacarpal. So. So your saddle joint is not here. Your saddle joint is actually here, where, um, where your first uh, metacarpal articulates with your carpal bones. And it's a real simple, cool concept to understand. If, if you had a um, if you had a horse, I'm not going to draw the horse, but I'm going to draw a sway back of the horse, right? So there's the horse's tail. There's his body, there's some horse ears, and, uh, all right, yay, that's a wolf, okay. But the point is, is that if you had a saddle that you can imagine being put on the horse, okay, that saddle, I know literally it can't do it because of friction, mm, but, but that saddle could sway this way, and it could also sway that way. We've seen movies where people, you know, they don't fasten the saddle right, and the saddle falls off the horse, and so that's, Guys, that's, that's what's happening here, man. This is really cool. You basically have an articulation where this carpal bone right here is like the sway. Let me see if I could get it in there. Uh, there she is. Right there. Right there. You can see that horse sway on that carpal bone. See it? Look at that horse sway. You see that dip? right there there right there that dip it's like the sway of a horseback and so the first the base of the first metacarpal is the saddle that fits on that carpal horseback and the base of the first metacarpal can do this or it can do this it's really cool okay there's some, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you any, it's important you know that that's a saddle joint and it's special. It's only located there because, you know, we need to play video games. But the, the main thing is that there is some debate about its, um, its movement capabilities. And so some people say, um, no, it's biaxial because it can do this and it can do that. And other people are like, ah, it's triaxial because it shades more to, instead of a ball and socket, it's almost kind of like a socket on a socket. And that kind of gives it some special third dimensional motion. I don't care. So, uh, so there is some debate. You may see some books that'll give it biaxial, some that'll say triaxial. I, I typically look at it as a special, if you, if you had to be like, well, what do you think? Uh, I'd give it a, a more of a specialized biaxial uh, capabilities. But, but here's the main thing. Flexion and extension doesn't change, even though it's in a different dimension for the thumb. In other words, you notice how the fingers go into a ball like this, but the thumb goes into a ball like this, right? So that's the important thing, is that flexion of my thumb is going to help me get into a ball. Okay, It's just in a different perspective. You're anatomical, you're facing here. The thumb's anatomical is facing there. The thumb is facing this way, okay? So flexion, extension, flexion, extension, okay? Get into a ball. All right. So that goes through our main classifications of joints. And what I'm going to do is for our next, uh, our post-first test lecture, when we get into the specific joints, that's when I'm going to say, hey, let's talk about the ankle in much more detail. Let's become masters of ankle joint, uh, not only morphology, not only how it's built, the bones that articulate it. I'm going to hit up some ligaments and some special uniqueness about it. And then we're going to get into the, the nuts and bolts, positions and motion and illusions. Hey, this is when it may not look like it's moving, but it is. And hey, this is when it may look like 
it's not moving. I'm sorry, it looks like it's not moving and it is, and it looks like it's moving and it's not, okay? All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shift my computer so that I could see uh, uh, my computer screen and to make sure I hit up on everything that you guys are gonna need to be accountable for for your first test, okay? So we got live action here. Uh, all right, welcome. Travel cross country. So, uh, common joint motions in, this is on page 14, uh, frontal planes, transverse planes, that, that's just introduction stuff, right? I'm gonna get into the more specific details and especially illusions, but I want you to kind of have that planted in your head so that way when I do get into it, maybe you've, all, hopefully you've been introduced to these terms before, okay? Uh, why do joints rotate? We rotate to translate. We've had that before. Uh, I lectured last class about functional circle of reach and sight. Uh, let me get into simultaneous and sequential motion. This is just an introduction. We developed this more in biomechanics. This helps to explain some illusions. Um, you know, maybe in some of your intro classes, you've only had a question about one joint moving at a time. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to develop these concepts so that we can see multiple joints moving at the same time and not fall for the distraction. Oh, the hand translated. Yeah, that's awesome. Because the shoulder did something and because the elbow did something at the same time, they summated their forward movement to let your hand go forward. Okay. But they canceled out their rotational movement in order to keep the hand going forward. Let me try to explain this to you. The shoulder wants to go forward and across general motion, some of its rotation and some of its translation. The elbow wants to go forward as well. So the elbow and the shoulder are on the same page. However, the shoulder wants to rotate me this way and the elbow wants to rotate me the other way. So in other words, when I do a simple task like reaching forward, I have to realize that the shoulder wants to take my hand out of position this way. Or my elbow wants to take my hand out of position the other way. But when both of them take my hand out of position in two different ways at the same time, they cancel out each other's rotation and summate each other's translation. That's simultaneous motion. It's a movement strategy we've been doing for a long, long time. And it adds to, it adds to illusions. I'm doing a lecture right now. It adds to illusions. In other words, watch what happens if I do these joint motions separately. Same thing, reaching forward, shoulder and elbow, but I'm gonna do them one at a time. Shoulder first, then elbow. Got me to the same place. Elbow first, then shoulder. Got me to the same place, okay? So simultaneous motions can lead to some of our illusionary issues. And then we get into sequenced motions. Sequence doesn't happen at the same time, they happen in order. So you think about a sequence of events. This event happened, then that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. And so sequenced motions are typically used when we're trying to make something move fast. You know, you think about a pitcher where they're gonna have different joint motions happening one after the other, where you're trying to summate velocity. Here's an easy way to look at it whipping somebody with a, with a wet towel. I'm not saying you should to practice this concept. It's just that when you try to pop someone with a towel and when you snap that towel, that's because the tip of that towel is moving faster than sound. That's a little sonic boom. When people crack a whip, the tip of that whip's moving faster than sound, sonic boom. If you're trying to pop someone with a towel, you don't do simultaneous motion. You don't take the towel and throw the towel at them. You do a sequenced motion where the, the towel, every bit of that towel is moving faster and faster and faster than the, tip bef than the piece of towel before. You're summating motion by sequence. Throwing, kicking, 
You know, you have a lot of tasks that require sequenced motion, one motion done uh, before the other. Those are actually usually easy uh, to decipher joint motions if your camera is slow enough, because a lot of times um, the motion happens faster than what our eyes can process. We have, we have cameras that can take flip book pictures, but, but we're limited to our frames per second. They're not high speed cameras is what I'm trying to say. And so we have these three dimensional cameras. That's why your eyes are, 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 are um, ellipsed. That's why they're, they're, they're angled so that you can get, and then the third dimension. That's why your eyes contour so that you can get a reference of that third dimension. Also an interesting fact, your eyes are part of your brain. It's an exposed part of your brain. That's wild, man. So sequence motion, super easy to interpret if you can slow it down, okay? All right, what else do we need to know for your test? I already talked about the prefixed hyper. Uh, range of motion, how much, think of range of motion is how far does the highway go? So you think about an interstate, right? And you have a road, you have two directions of motion, and a finite mileage of that road. <laughs> I-10 only goes so far east until you run out of I-10. West only goes so far west until you run out of I-10. It's the same concept with range of motion. So your wrist has a road in the sagittal plane, and you can only go so far of flexion from anatomical, and you can only go so much for extension from anatomical. And your range of motion is this furthest position from anatomical in terms of flexed to this position from anatomical in terms of extended. That is your range of motion. And some of you guys, this is really, really going to be important because normal function to have, I say normal function, but to have function within normal limits, you got to be within a certain range of motion or you increase the chance of problems arising from not being in normal motion. Meaning that if your ankle doesn't have normal range of motion, you may be susceptible to stress fractures or, or uh, Achilles problems or, or plantar fasciitis, okay? So, so knowing range of motion, knowing what joints should be able to do it's kind of like being a mechanic. You got to kick the tires and, and, and knowing the limitations of the car, be able to check things to make sure that car is within working limits of all the different movable pieces, okay? ranges of motion. All right. Our appendicular verbiage of motion is important as well. I want to hit up on this. This is right after uh, your axes. This is on page 13. So... We do not assume that's one of your commandments, right? And so one of the ways to be a better clinician is to be a better communicator. Well, a better way to be a better anything is to be a better communicator. And so one of the ways we communicate, one of the ways we have better communication with, within the area of anatomical kinesiology is identifying side joints and motions. Now, the whys? Well, because things are relative. Your right is my left, if I'm looking at you, right? So if I'm looking at everybody and we're playing Simon Says, and I say, Simon Says, shift, shuffle to your right. And I start going this way, several kids, I'm not saying you know, everybody, but several kids are just gonna follow me because I went this way and I, I wasn't lying to them. I went to my right, but my right is their left, okay? Uh, another example of why this is important, uh, in surgeries, especially amputations, but in all surgeries, now when they're prepping the patient, they'll put a big red X, do not cut. That's do not, why? Oh my God, we gotta amputate the right arm as fast as possible or they could die amputate right arm. I go down to cut the right arm. Well, guess what? My right is their left. I know that sounds like duh, but that happens. It's happened. Why do you think they have uh, warning signs on Halloween costumes? Uh, the wearer of this costume, a Superman costume, they have this. The wearer of this costume would not be able to fly. 
So to better communicate, we have to understand that I have a right elbow and a left elbow, and they are independent of each other. I have a right scapula and a left scapula, and they are independent of each other. I have one cervical vertebra column, but it could bend to the right or it could bend to the left. My right, my left. So side, joint, and motion is very important. When I'm going to be showing you guys pelvic girdle rotations, and we're going to see how the pelvis can be spun because of the hips, when I spin the pelvis to its right, it's because the left hip and the right hip did two different things. So we need to say, well, if they did two different things, what did the right hip do? What did the left hip do? <clears throat> so side, identify the side. And it's always going to be from the person who you're analyzing. When you're working with a client, it's their right and their left. And if you have a tough time seeing it, you have to literally just put yourself in their shoes and say, well, let me see it how they're seeing it. Their right, their left. So we communicate position and motion by, and, and we be better communicators by identifying what side we're talking about. The right, the left, or both. We have a word for both. Bilateral. Bilateral axis passes through both sides. Identify the side. Then identify what joint we're going to analyze. We break down motion joint by joint. That's one of the tricks. That's one of the magics. That's what you're going to get your money's worth. I'm a biomechanist. I've been doing this for a long time, and I don't analyze joints from the whole body. If, if, if someone says, what's Neo from the Matrix doing when he's doing like this? I'm like, well, let's start with the elbow. Let's go to the – actually, I usually start proximal to distally, but, but – the elbow position or motion has nothing to do with what the, what, the, what the wrist is doing. What the elbow is doing has nothing to do with the wrist. And the shoulder has nothing to do with the elbow. Now, they're working together, but on a football team, you got a lot of players working together. But the quarterback is a different position than the offensive line. They're still working together, but you can analyze position by position. It's the same thing here. These are just players. So we analyze motion joint by joint. So we identify what side we're going to analyze, then we identify what joint we're going to analyze. If someone's doing a vertical jump and they say, what, what, you know, can you analyze this motion? I'm like, sure. What, where do you want to start? Let's start with the ankles. Let's just look at the ankles. And what that's going to teach you is how to avoid distractions because you've got a lot of distractions happening. Let's just focus on the ankles and see what the ankles are doing. And if you know normal range of motion, you could be like, well, this is what's supposed to happen. Oh, but this is what I saw. Maybe there's a problem in there. We can investigate more. Okay. Side joint motion. Identify side, identify a joint you want to look at, analyze, and then motion. Where is it at? What's its position? How is it moving? Then you could get into the nuts and bolts. If you don't narrow down side and joint, joints, there's different joints that have different motion capabilities. So you can't talk about motion until you've identified the joint. It would be easy if every joint motion had a different name, but you got a lot of joints that flex. You got a lot of joints that extend. You got several joints that abduct and adduct. So to be better communicators, we have to really funnel down who are we talking about ab and adducting? Who are we talking about flexing and extending? And again, just because one joint is flexed doesn't mean the other joint can't be extended. And some people think they're doing the same thing. Why? Because they have a global reference. But it's not. It's a local reference. This one is extended. This one is flexed. It looks like windshield wipers, Wee! but it's not. Okay. Ooh, I feel like I'm, I'm a preacher. Get off my soapbox. All right. So you should have everything you need for your first test. All right. Check uh, Moodle. I communicated when that test is going to be. I hope everybody's doing well. Let's do it. Let's knock this first test out the park.